Today, we'll be talking about navigational narratives with Before GPS, Getting Lost and Found in Early America. I'm Keelan Burke, Director of Fellowships and Academic Programs at the Newberry, and I'm here with Jamie Volker, a literary scholar and long-term fellow at the Newberry. Today, we're going to be looking at how in American literature and culture, navigation isn't just a matter of following directions and getting from point A to point B, um, but thinking of how to traverse geographic spaces to go on a spiritual journey of self-discovery. So thank you, Jamie, for joining us. Um, for those of you who are joining us live on Facebook or YouTube, if you have questions, please go ahead and write those into the comments and we'll get to those as we can. To begin with, I would like to start with a big question about how you define a navigational narrative. Can you give us a bird's eye view of what kinds of narratives you're sort of bringing together under this umbrella? Sure, thank you. And thank you also for having me here today. Um, so what I'm thinking of an, as a navigational narrative is pretty broad, but also I have some specific ideas about it. So a navigational narrative is any sort of story that um, tells about how someone got lost and found their way, essentially, is what I'm thinking of. But it doesn't necessarily have to be a written text, it can also be a map. So essentially, I want to think about different forms of narratives. So it could be a guidebook, it could be a map. Essentially, a map or a guidebook is a first person narrative in some way, and that it, it gives the representations of what someone experienced in their own experiences navigating um, some sort of wilderness space or a space unknown to them. And so specifically the narratives that I'm looking at focus on um, early America. So kind of the times before um, America was established or as settled as it is today. And so um, what I'm interested in is how an author faces some sort of navigational failure and how that affects who they are as a person. So they might get terribly lost and become really afraid and kind of lose their sense of who they are, but they also might find some sense of who they are in the wilderness. Like they might find God, they might find some sort of religious or spiritual understanding or some come to new, some new philosophical insight. Um, so I'm also interested in, you know, especially colonial settlers and enslaved people and how the United States was developed as people kind of found their way across the Western, um, the, across the West and across the Atlantic Ocean. And what I'm finding is that as much as we, you know, can celebrate how people found themselves in the wilderness, a lot of this sense of people being able to find their way was dependent upon Native Americans and indigenous people and how they guided um, these travelers along their way and helped them not only just to physically find their way, but also map certain spaces. So kind of proliferate kind of American empire in some ways. And so I'm interested kind of in the trajectory of how people began to not find their way throughout spaces, get lost, but eventually kind of go out further and further west in the American continent to find out who they are and to find out who they are as a nation. And so Specifically, um, I look at different kinds of captivity narratives. So people who were taken captive by Native Americans and then had different interactions with them. So sometimes they um, would stay with the people who the Native tribes that they were captured. Some of them left, were really angry, and you know, some of them really found enlightenment in their experiences. Um, also novels about travel, fugitive slave narratives, um, surveyors reports. Yeah, so here are some examples. Um, so one fugitive slave narrative that I'm interested in is by William Wells Brown, and that's on the, the right side of the screen. And so he finds his way to freedom in the North by following and finding the North Star. So, that, you know, if you follow the North Star, it kind of takes you North, obviously. So that was a big symbol for freedom, as well as an obvious, like real wayfinding or navigational tool for people. Then I'm also interested in travel journals. So like in a little while, we'll talk about Lewis and Clark. Um, as well as, you know, famous novels like Robinson Crusoe. So he's a sailor lost at sea. Um, he essentially like loses direction and that's how they end up getting like crashing and chipwrecking because they kind of can't find longitude. Um, they don't know where they are. So eventually he does find his way with the help of, um, of Friday. He kind of becomes a personal and spiritual guide for him on the island. And actually he also guides Crusoe um, when they're in Europe, kind of getting back to home. Like he actually is a travel guide for them too. So then I'm also interested in stories about like frontiersmen who went out into the wilderness as well as young children who happened to get lost. Um, so the story in the middle here is about um, the Lost Boys of the Alleghenies, which took place, or it's set in the 1850s and it actually was a real event. So that was also a common problem that 
children, especially who, you know, might kind of wander off on their own and not has have as good of a sense of direction as older adults would or know their way around. Um, there were, that was a big problem in early America that children would go missing. Um, so unfortunately in this story, the children are found dead, but there are other stories that I look at where there, is, there are happier endings um, for those as well. And so what kind of I found is through looking at, you know, I start kind of with um, in the 1550s, and go up to the 1850s, so kind of a large span of time, um, is found that conceptions of the environment have shifted throughout time. So at first, with I'll talk about Mary Rowlandson in just a minute. Um, she was very averse to wanting to go into the wilderness. She was taken captive by the Narragansett. Um, but then by the time we get to Thoreau later in the 18th century, the 19th century, he was very much all about going out into the wilderness and finding your way. So essentially, there seems to be a shift. And I think what's interesting is that um, people are interested now, especially today, about what it means to find yourself. And so what my project is kind of trying to emphasize is that the idea of trying to find yourself really boils down to how navigators attempted to find their positions in space. So essentially to find oneself is very much a geographical enterprise or sort of, you know, relates to these very earlier, at least American um, non-Indigenous American sense of identity is tied to finding one sense uh, sense of place in space. Thank you. Um, you've really kind of brought together a whole bunch of different kinds of narratives or genres of writing or even not exactly writing, as you're saying, so map making, um, which really sort of helps us think what a nav navigational narrative um, would be. Um, and one of those that has sort of piqued my interest um, is you were talking about those captivity narratives. Um, and I know you mentioned Mary Rowlandson. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, a captivity narrative um, and also maybe about this one in particular? Sure, yeah. So, I mean, first of all, the Newberry is a great place if, to come if you want to look at, uh, at captivity nerves. They have a very large collection and some very rare text here. So I'll show just right, what's on the screen right now is a uh, 1682 edition of Mary Rowlandson's captivity narrative. It's had a couple different titles, but this one is a true history of the captivity and restoration of Mary Rowlandson. And then on the right is um, the, the narrative, the Relacion by Cabeza de Vaca, who um, this is an 1555 edition of the text. So again, these are both really rare editions of these texts and they are in the Newberry. So just a plug if you wanna go um, to find some of these really rare captivity narratives, Newberry is a place, great place to go. So, um, but anyway, back to the actual, the content. So, I mean, I think with these two texts, there's kind of a range in response of the author writing the captivity narrative. So, for instance, Mary Rowlandson very much disliked her experience in the wilderness. She was uh, averse to the natives that, you know, took, you know, took her captive. She did not want to become part of their culture. Eventually, she does sort of assimilate, but by the end, she tries to remove herself from it. Um, so she was, it's very much, again, this idea that the wilderness is a very harrowing, fearful place. So the, the um, narrative of Cabeza de Vaca is really interesting. So if you haven't ever read it, maybe you, if you've heard of Captivity Narratives, you've probably heard of Mary Rowlandson. Cabeza de Vaca, maybe you have. So it's part captivity narrative, part kind of adventure uh, exploration narrative. But so Cabeza de Vaca is on an expedition from Spain to kind of explore the southwest. So, um, excuse me, southeast um, of America. So kind of in Florida and Texas today. Um, but so at one point he is taken captive by different indigenous tribes, but then he also then goes out on an expedition leading other men in his, um, in his group actually going out to heal Native American people that he's meeting. And so they ask him to heal them and he kind of gets a reputation and then natives guide him from place to place. Um, and so what I find interesting in captivity narratives, both that I think both Rowlandson and Cabeza de Vaca share is the sense that Native Americans ultimately are guiding these colonists in their spiritual journeys. So as, as they guide them from place to place, you know, the, the, the people who are traveling, so the white travelers or uh, European travelers are learning things about themselves and the environment. So I'm interested in my book project is also interested in how much, you know, colonists take from Native Americans in terms of that guidance that they provide. <laughs> 
Thank you for both of those examples and lovely images from the Newberry's collection. Um, and thinking about that particular um, captivity narrative and the ways that it's not the same kind of across time and space and even in, in similar times. Um, for those of you who may be just joining us, um, I'm Keelan Burke. I'm here with Jamie Volker and we are talking about before GPS getting lost and found in early America. Um, so Jamie, another of the um, uh, types of narratives you've described to us is one that I think that many of us may be very familiar with or at least know about, which is the, um, the narrative of Lewis and Clark. So that's a particular kind of navigational narrative, which is different than, than the captivity narratives you just talked about. Um, can you talk to us about how you're thinking of Lewis and Clark in this wider context of these navigational narratives? And, and what kinds of materials are you looking at or using when you're working on this part of your project? Okay, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, formally wise, so different in terms of genre, it is a travel journal versus these are more um, kind of formalized captivity narratives. So they're a little more polished uh, than the Lewis and Clark journals are. So that's one difference. Um, but one thing that I am interested in is um, how so much of kind of American history is interested in what Lewis and Clark found and what they discovered, you know, they're called the core of discovery. But what I want to have us focus on is what was actually lost during the expedition. And so first, first of all, it was their sense of direction. So right here in front of us, we have this um, 1811 manuscript map that uh, Clark made of the expedition. So obviously, he by that point knew pretty well what he where he had traveled, where the expedition had gone. So again, this is at the Newberry. So another plug for great materials at the Newberry. Um, but what happened was so in once they got to a certain point they you know were following the Missouri River they get to what a place called Fort Mandan in North Carolina and pretty much after that point they don't know where they're going they don't essentially don't know how big the Rocky Mountains are where exactly they are how easy it might be to cross them and then how you know how they would then get to the Pacific coast because essentially Thomas Jefferson sent them out on this mission to find an all water coast from um, the Atlantic to the Pacific. So, you know, a cross country water route that didn't exist. So they kind of were surprised in terms of what they had to do to get across the Rocky Mountains. And so again, kind of thinking about the themes of Native American um, guidance here, one of the thing, I think common misconceptions and then that I, th I even, you know, had myself um, before getting into this project was that Sacagawea was the main guide of the expedition. So as much as she did help in some ways navigationally, she was primary, like did a lot of the, the help that she did was interpreting um, and it being a diplomat for the expedition. But I wanna show that there's actually a lot of other important indigenous people that helped them along the way. So specifically, I think one of the most important ones is um, a Shoshone man named Toby and his son. So he got them across the Rocky Mountains, which if you had seen a, like the earlier maps that Lewis and Clark had, they were did not depict the Rocky Mountains at all in the way that they actually are. They're like kind of small little bands of mountains. They didn't think that they were bigger than the Appalachian. So once they kind of finally approached them, I think they began to panic and be like, OK, we need someone to guide us through the mountains. So I think um, as much as, you know, Lewis and Clark are good navigators. So I think they had the skills to navigate and could find their way pretty well. Um, but ultimately, they would not have been successful without these Native American guides. So there are Shoshone people as well as Nez Perce um, leaders and guides that also then took them back across the Rocky Mountains. Like they actually, Lewis and Clark actually had to turn around because they were afraid they were going to get lost on their own. So again, probably the success of the expedition really did rest on the kind of the hospitality of these guides. Um, they also were paid, you know, by Lewis and Clark so that, you know, they got a little bit out of the deal, but obviously they were kind of risking their own lives in the process. Um, so that's kind of what I'm focus on is that there's all these ways that they did find their way, but there are also all these ways that they were really lost and kind of didn't know where they were going or didn't know what was coming ahead. Um, and then as far as materials go, um, so I think about my project, I think about how do people navigate? And one of the ways that people navigate is by writing, is by keeping journals. Um, so one of the objects that's really interesting to me um, at the Newbury is the Joseph Whitehouse journal. So Joseph Whitehouse was a private on the expedition. He was one of the journal keepers. So you see on the left here, this is again at the Newbury, um, a really cool looking journal. So, I mean, it's, you can see it's kind of like elk skin or animal skin that's been shrunken. You can see kind of holes in the object. So you can tell that this um, journal really has had some mileage to it. It's seen some things and it's been some places. 
And so what I want to think about for my project too, especially with um, Lewis and Clark, is how they use the journals, what they were writing every day to kind of orient themselves. So not only, so in the picture here on the right, we can see like there's a latitudinal uh, coordinate here. So he writes what the latitude is at that point in their journey. Um, Lewis and Clark did more of that in terms of writing their coordinates down, but it shows that even other members of the expeditions were interested in finding exactly where they were. So that the journals could then function as not just like telling them directly where they are, but then as a way to kind of reflect on who they are in that space. So kind of, I like to see that writing journals is actually a form of navigation and it's also a, its own kind of navigational narrative. Um, Okay, so then I also have some actual objects to show. Um, so this, you can see it here, is what I believe is a 19th century um, octant. So unfortunately, this one, I got this one on eBay. It's missing the thing that makes it functional. So it's missing the little radius, the measurement. So what someone would do with an octant, so Lewis and Clark had one like this, uh, with, that would be functional, um, but they would use this to kind of look at the North Star or at the sun and then use the little measurements here to measure the angle to get the altitude to eventually get to the latitude. So that's kind of one way of finding themselves. So that's one object. So that's a little bit bigger. That one's made of wood. Uh, this is called a sextant. Um, so this is a contemporary example. So this is, I, you know, got this more recently. Um, so I think it's, this one actually is functional. So it probably, it operates pretty similarly to a, an octant, um, but it's made of metal. That was an improvement. It also, even though this one's really small, it did have a longer um, degree so that you could have a better sense of uh, measurement with this one. And it has all these little uh, viewing lenses that all of I, which I still need to learn a little bit more about. Um, so anyway, I kind of what I want to show with these objects and what I'm kind of learning about them too is how difficult it was even to do the easy steps of finding latitude. It took a lot of time. It took a lot of effort. Um, Lewis and Clark spent a lot of time, you know, documenting their, you know, their coordinates and things like that. Um, so as much as, um, you know, they maybe these were the easier ones to use. It's just kind of fun to think about how difficult it was for them versus us just maybe opening up our Google Maps smartphone app. You can find your coordinates exactly and know exactly where you are and, you know, find your way fairly easily. Um, so those are kind of the materials that I've, you know, really dived into working on the Lewis and Clark expedition in my in my studies. Thank you. That's fascinating. Both the pieces that you're pulling, you know, from the different navigational narratives in the collection and in other collections that you've been working with sort of archivally, but also thinking very materially and physically about how you would get around in those spaces um, or get lost in those spaces. As somebody who grew up at the foothill of the Rocky Mountains, I can tell you, as you look up to them, it's not an easy pass to just yeah. make it over. Um, so something you just mentioned sort of triggered a, a thought, um, thinking about how these narratives you mentioned kind of GPS and getting around now. It's in the title of our program today. Um, but, and you say your project is set, you know, 1550 to 1850, but you're also thinking kind of more broadly and about how these navigational narratives are still happening, right? There's still ways that we tell ourselves stories about how we're getting around. Um, so I'm wondering if you can just give us a little peek into sort of the trajectory of those navigational narratives kind of over time. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm interested, you know, my book talks a lot about, you know, the kind of written narratives, the more story literary narratives, but another sense of narrative that I'm thinking of is how people told other people how to find directions. So like basically guidebooks. Um, and so one of the earliest ones that I found in the Newberry's collections that I think was pretty influential um, was by John Ogilvy. Um, and it was a road guide from, this one is from 1719. This one was kind of a later edition of a more famous one called Britannia that was from 1675. So kind of similar style, but what I find interesting with these is it's kind of how the rows go up and down and it's like made to look like a, a strip of piece of paper. Um, and so essentially it gives, you know, landmarks. It also give my like mileage markers or point markers and kind of goes, you know, from point to point up and up and down. You can kind of follow it along from different places in London. And so I was struck by this because by the time we get to the end of this, um, I'm interested in how all these kind of ways that we tell each other how to find directions are really similar. Like there's some, some common principles. And so I think at least visually, 
this, I want to start with this one to so we can compare it to by the end when I get to Google Maps and how we can be sort of similar. Um, so this is a 17th and 18th century example. So this is kind of based on the 17th, you know, into revised into the 18th century. Um, and so then I also have had seen some examples of 19th century uh, Mississippi River guides. And so again, we see that similar sort of ribbon style. So on the left, um, it's called the Western Pilot, and that's from 1845. Um, and that is, you know, a pretty fairly extensive guide to the Mississippi River. Um, and so similarly, so I think the original Ogilvy had also directions alongside some of those maps that had both. So we can see here both the visual image and then alongside the actual point by point directions. Um, so again, that, that kind of ribbon is here again. And so then on the right is also a really cool map um, of, it's called the Father of Waters, again, a Mississippi River map. So this one is, um, from 1866, also again in the Newberry collections, it's actually 11 feet long. Um, so it operates, and I'll, we can show the video if you want to show that next. Um, so you actually turn a crank, and so this is it coming back in. Um, but that's how someone would kind of like as they're following along on the Mississippi River, like on a steamship, and it would usually be tourists using these. Um, they would kind of crank and unroll it to try and see, you know, where exactly they are. And it's also a really interesting perspective because obviously the Mississippi River isn't just a straight line, <laughs> you know. So it's, you know, kind of they're condensing um, the image into one kind of flat panel. Um, so then if we want to get into then the 20th century, I see some also some parallels. So this one here is called Gorman's Reliable Road Guide around Chicago, and that's from 1919. And again, we're seeing that, again, that similar ribbon style map. So kind of, and then point to point directions. So this one has mileage markers going from Chicago to Milwaukee. So again, combining specific directions alongside an image, kind of the strip sort of image. Um, there's another really cool, these are probably what some of my favorite things in the Newberry collection um, are these photo auto guides. Um, so this one is, um, it's a photo auto guide from Chicago to Lake Geneva, and that's from 1905. And what I love about this is how specific it is. So someone actually went around and took photos of each turn by turn direction of getting from Chicago to Lake Geneva. So you can see a physical, you know, a picture, um, as well as the actual direction. And so you can see that this is pretty much a precursor to Google Maps Street View. Like if you ever go into, you can kind of put the little character to look around the street. And so this is essentially giving you that. So I, my sense is that there were not a lot of these made because probably is very expensive to go around and photograph each turn by turn um, direction to get from one place to the other. There's also one that goes from New York to Chicago. That's really interesting too. I think there's like 800 steps to do that. So there are a lot of steps, um, you know, to get from one of these places to another. So I think one thing that I find interesting among all of these is sort of the ephemeral nature of these directions. So obviously, so I think actually Jim Ackerman at the Newberry created a, a different edition of this text where he went and took new photos of the new locations. So to see what's the same and what's different by this time. Um, and so I think we can see though that there's a very limited usefulness of these. Um, so that's probably maybe also why they weren't is used as much because if a building is gone, then you don't have that landmark there anymore. Um, so then obviously moving into the 21st century, our biggest way that we uh, find direction is through Google Maps. And so I guess I just was always really struck by like the physical, you know, rectangular shape, ribbon shape of Google Maps on our smartphone. And then what we saw in the, you know, the 1675, 1719 Ogilvy um, direction, um, direction guide. So a road guide, if you want to call it. Um, so yeah, again, kind of those strips. And so essentially, if you take screenshots, it's really pretty similar to that if you're going to kind of go along the route. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm, so some of the things that kind of stand out to me is like what we, as we move from the 17th to the 21st century is that there's this constant need to know where we are and to try and also to help other people find where they are. Because obviously someone created Google Maps, Ogilvy created these guides um, because people were really interested in, you know, finding where they are, but also in not getting lost. Because I think there's a constant fear governing us as humans not to get lost. And so people who study wayfinding, which is the term kind of the 
more scientific term for navigation, um, everyday sort of navigation, claim that wayfinding is uh, an evolutionary um, characteristics of humans. Uh, basically, we evolved as a species because we were able to find our way across large swaths of land. And so because we are now turning to GPS so much, we're kind of losing our sense of wayfinding, we're losing our sense of direction. And so I think that is a problem that we're facing right now. But one thing that I think we can maybe see the positive in that is that we are also creating all these different forms of navigational narratives. So Google Maps kind of provides a whole host of different narratives in one form of technology. So it's kind of become a restaurant guide, it's become a travel guide. Um, it's also, you know, kind of you can track your own progress. So it's almost like a travel diary in a way, if you can look back on your previous searches. So I think that there's a way, an interesting way that we can think about now of technology as telling navigational narratives or just telling stories about who we are as people and how we navigate our environments as well. Thank you for that um, uh, kind of map a way finding through these different navigational narratives. Um, one of the other things that struck me is sort of thinking of that ribbon map and also those the GPS that we have in our pockets now is a is a desire to make things portable, but also the human sort of constraints around like what you can actually put in your pocket or your bag and take with you down the Mississippi or you know across town. So like there is uh, many of these things still come in a small enough size that they're portable from here or there. Um, so my last question um, today, um, you've sort of alluded to this in, in many of the pieces that you've talked about. Um, you have showed us a, a lot of really great images and materials that you've worked with at the Newberry um, so far, but I'm wondering if you can just say a few last words about um, why the Newberry is a good place to do the kind of work and research that you're doing to tell the stories that you're telling. Um, and maybe if there are a couple more navigational narratives um, or ways of thinking about those in the collection that you wanna highlight for us that to kind of don't fall into to exactly the project, what you've, what you've shown so far. If there's any other highlights you'd like to share with us. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, I think one of the things that Newberry is really well known for is the collection of maps and cartography. And so I think one thing that I learned um, about what happened is kind of before my project. So again, starting in the 16th century-ish. Um, and so I found all these different maps that really kind of tell the story of the colonization of the Americas. And so I was kind of surprised when I saw, I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but I was, um, by this map from 1480, uh, 1486, the Cosmographia. So there's actually North and South America aren't on this map, or at least I could not decipher them on this map. So essentially this is before Columbus. So this is before Europeans would have had a sense of where North and South America were. Um, so that was kind of a surprising thing to see, but I think one of the narratives that the Newberry tells in their collection is how, you know, not only world history developed, but also you know, North American colonization sort of developed. So that one was really interesting to me. Obviously there's, you know, very ornately designed with the little heads blowing the winds um, in the corners. And then there's another one from 1540. Um, that one is called, uh, sorry, the Geographia Universalis, and this is from 1540. And so what really interested me in these maps is not only the unusual shape of, you know, obviously North America. So it's very different than a map that you would look at today um, in terms of proportions. But also if you look in the South America um, continent, you see in the, the corner, the right corner there, it says cannibals and there's actually a little picture of a leg. Um, so we can, you can get the sense that these, you know, uh, views about indigenous people were forming already back then. So that, you know, the view that they were cannibals, you know, frightening people, um, were in place then and kind of continued throughout colonization. Um, and so then, you know, that it was kind of one period. And then I just want to talk then about, um, lastly, about Portland charts. And these were from around 1550. And so I was, I was interested in these particularly because I think uh, to think about, you know, Spanish as some of the first um, colonists to the Americas. And so these were Portland charts were one of the first, at least the one on the left, um, kind of the first really significant form of navigational technology in terms of people would follow, the sailors would follow one of the lines to kind of, you know, that's how they would follow, get to get from one place to another. Um, and again, with the shapes of the maps are obviously we can, you know, critique them for their shapes, but I think it's interesting to see how people were depicted 
we're depicting visually what the lands that they are experiencing um, themselves. And so um, the, I kind of ended here with what I'm thinking about, because I think this really told me a story about uh, early America and what, you know, how America as we see it today kind of came into being through these maps. Obviously it was there before, but how Europeans perceived it as coming into being. Um, and it really helped me to think about what early America really is. You know, when did America really start? Because um, I think in my own studies, I tended to think about New England and the Puritans as the start of America. But really, I mean, Native Americans and indigenous people were here for much longer than that. Um, so it kind of got me to be thinking about, okay, you know, what do we do with these maps? Um, and when does America really start? Um, so this was kind of got me to be thinking about before I get to like Mary Rowlandson as a Puritan. And we kind of have then, you know, John Smith's maps and things like that, that, you know, closely document what um, the New England colonies looked like. Thank you, Jamie, for um, sharing those with us and for sharing your research and what you've been working on at the Newberry and your project and helping us think about navigational narratives in early America. Um, we had one question from the audience, um, which I think I may take a stab at and you can correct me. Um, it's just about a date on the, um, the ribbon map and that's 1860s, somewhere around there, yeah, is 18, that right? Yeah. Yeah, um, so that was um, our, um, our last question. So thank you for that. Um, and I would also like to just say uh, uh, thank you to everybody for joining us and thank you very much, Jamie, for taking the time this afternoon and for sharing all of this um, wonderful work um, that you have been spending your time this last year at the Newberry. Um, and I'll also like to um, go ahead and give a plug to anybody who wants to come down to the Newberry to look at any of these amazing objects or many of the others that we have in our collection. Um, that's one of the uh, joys of the Newberry's collection is because we have the breadth and depth that we have, you can see everything from those 1550 maps up to these 20th century, you know, photo um, guides of uh, of how to get from Chicago to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yeah, Milwaukee, and then also Lake Geneva, and if you want yeah. to go to Chicago, yeah. New York, yeah, <laughs> Chicago, New York, all those things. So come on down to the Newberry um, and see that. So thank you, Jamie.